from Powax, and in this video, we are going to be watching the Maryland versus Virginia game for the purpose of kind of exploring some of Maryland's positionless offense, as well as, you know, just kind of evaluating things and just kind of watching. So, as we get into this video, first is my, uh, what would you call it, my just announcement that, you know, in this I won't be doing any... Um, like I don't get anything for the ads that run. Veritone is the company that runs the Big Tens. Um, they're kind of copyright strikes, and they're going to hit this in two seconds. So that's where the, all that will go. Um, if you enjoy this video, let me, let me know what you think. And as we're watching through, if you have any comments or questions or you want me to pay attention to something or talk about something specific, let me know, and I'll get right to it. We're going to try to go until about 6. And, um, yeah, so if you have anything that you want to see, definitely let me know. So let's get right into it. So we're going to start with the second um, the second quarter. So here we've got face-off happening. And so um, I want to say Maryland scores six goals in this quarter. Or I guess I'm doing the third quarter. Oh, no, it just says third. That's right. They mix this up, and then it goes back to the second. But so, yeah, definitely leave your comments if you want to see something um, or, or want me to address something. But so the reason I wanted to pick this game and I wanted to watch Maryland, obviously, is because when I picked, I, I if I had done a, a uh, kind of weekly pick em video last week when we were in Utah, I definitely would have picked UVA over Maryland because they were playing very well. Then Maryland came out and just stomped them. And so, you know, kind of recognizing how they play is another thing I was discussing with one of the coaches in Utah and they, they he kind of like talked about some of the rules and so I wanted to kind of explore it because they he talks about positionless offense a lot and so let's just kind of break down the idea right so if you're coaching young players you're going to want them to know where to go, how to be open for each other, how to make sure we're moving the ball, how to attack with dodges, how to attack with cuts all of those kind of items, how to probe the defense, keep your eyes up. Um, each individual player has to know how to play, and that's kind of the most important part, right? But so the way that we mostly structure that as coaches, especially with players who are learning to play, is we put them into sets where they're not going to have too many decisions to make, and we're going to be able to rely on their playmaking ability. So once you get up to this level of you know collegiate ball, you can still have players in those sets and kind of have little places where they go to probably put them in their strengths. But what's been talked about in terms of what Maryland is doing is that they're putting their players into p positions where they're so good at decision-making and playing already that they just get to play. Now, that's very difficult because in terms of running that kind of idea with a, um, a high school offense because if you have any players that are inexperienced, they're not going to do that very well. So the concepts that I was discussing with one of the coaches in Utah was that basically as he was talking to some of the Maryland players, they basically said that when they bring in new new freshmen who are clearly the best players in the country at the high school level or at the you know post-grad level, their only rules are to have a outlet in front, an outlet behind, and a skip through. So that leaves two other players that can occupy the crease and kind of play on the crease, but they're always shifting and moving in all of these positions in order to just play. And what that does in terms of a coaching level, at least is how I would understand it, is it puts all of the coaching tactics onto the decision-making of the players within concepts of, you know, how to be positioned in space to allow a dodger to continue their dodge to draw the slide away from you so that you can be in a good position or you know how to make sure you're attacking the defense in, in a decent way and in order to get here we obviously have to know how offense is going to work you know before that but this is obviously just my kind of exploration of it and I kind of wanted to watch it anyway and honestly I don't have any time to watch it um, if I'm not, you know, doing some form of work. And so this is, this is, this is me working, watching this with you. But so once again, if you have any questions or comments, or you guys want me to address something that's on the field, definitely let me know, put it in the comment section and we'll address it. So here we have, um, one of the things that Maryland likes to do is they like to use this two man game. So this is just a two man game on the wing as they get set. Now, 
all of these players are kind of free to interact now, and you'll see a nice off-ball two-man um, you know, concept here as this player comes up to set his picks. Now, as we come off the pick here, slide is drawn. The pole here kind of gets a little too far down. They both now go to the ball. Now they miscommunicate. Ball is sent up, and you have a nice little step-down goal. You know, pretty easy in terms of prescribing it and describing exactly kind of what happens. But that's all... This is all created on the idea that the that, that Virginia wanted to maintain their matchups with Wisnowskis, right? So um, Logan Wisnowskis is one, you know, definitely a Tawaraton front runner. Now, as he tries to get back and these guys don't communicate, now, you know, this player is just on the wing ready to accept the pass. Now, let's look at what the other players are doing because, so from my perspective, one of the things that I do a lot when I coach is I want players to know exactly where they're going to go because for the most part their ability to play and to be creative in their space is, is kind of dependent on their understanding of what's going to happen next. Can they, um, I want them to be in positions they're going to be in a lot because that's going to allow them to then be creative because they're not going to have to think about where they need to be next or what's going to happen next. And so as they're playing, that's kind of the um, the overall idea is within an offense, I want them to know kind of what's coming next. But so within this, they're all just going to play. So now as the pick happens, we've got an off-ball pick coming to be set. And now they separate, right? So just an inside-out pick. They separate. They go back, and they're just kind of exchanging and playing. So when you think about what I mentioned before in terms of what the, the coach was telling me was their forward outlet, back outlet, backward outlet, through pass. So now this player is through 23 right here. This player is the through pass. This player is the backward outlet and was a part of the pick. So whichever way... Um, the Dodger goes, he would be the backward outlet, and then you have a forward outlet, and that allows these two players to operate inside off ball in order to create, you know, mayhem in terms of whatever they would want to do. So that's a cool concept. I like the idea of it, um, and that's kind of just how I see it in this in this first play. Now, one of the things that can be kind of tough for defensive teams. Um, not defensive teams. Well, yeah, for, for defense in that account is that if you have a bunch of players that are all dangerous on the field and they all utilize their strengths to play in specific spots, anytime you have to slide to help the ball, all the other players then have to be able to react and, and like play through um, kind of attacking. And it doesn't have to have a specific set. All right, so now I'm going to go through. We're going to get so Virginia scores here. We're going to skip through and go straight to Maryland. All right. Into the offensive end. This time Wisnowskis goes to the middle. He'd, he's here. They're starting to press out a bit. Virginia is. At least they were at X. So now it looks like we're setting up the same kind of idea where we're going to have a two-man game here. That creates our outlet behind. Someone should be popping at some point here for the forward outlet. Nice question mark. So let's let's go back on this and kind of see where we are. So is four? I want to know if four is a midfielder. I'm not sure, but so now they're subbing. Da 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 da. I think four is a midfielder. So as four comes into the offense, now he has no restraint in terms of getting to X, right? So now as they begin to play, whether this is an invert or not, doesn't really matter for how they're going to play. But so now you get a razor pick here, which you can say that they're all free-flowing, but for the most part, even though they're free-flowing, they're going to have specific tactics in terms of how they're going to attack, but they don't have to be in a specific spot, right? So... Um, it's just them 
having the ability. So now everyone's probably going to know that this player likes this razor pick in this spot as they're communicating and they're playing, which is going to allow them to then kind of attack in whatever way and kind of know what's going to happen next without having everyone in a specific spot. So it goes off the razor pick, no slide comes, all of the movement backside leaves him on an island. They try to slide Coma across, so Coma means across the crease, and there's a nice question mark. So let's go back to that. So here you've got all of the Virginia defensemen and all of the off-ball Maryland players kind of playing two-man games. Now what I noticed within the off-ball play here for a lot of the collegiate teams is that you're going to almost have like a waterfall concept where <clears throat> you kind of up pick the middle and then you kind of fountain down the sides so like you'll have a cut through here and then they'll come back up through the middle set your picks and you'll kind of come through and you're kind of cutting on both sides now as they're moving look at the heads of all of these players all the defensemen they're all kind of looking away, making sure that they're not giving up these easy passes with, with these off-ball players, which is not a terrible thing if you can cover in space. But if you have, you know, if you've got five kids that are going to Maryland or six kids that are going to Maryland that, that are, you know, the elite players, you definitely can't do this. Like if Maryland looked away from Connor Schellenberger on the other side, it'd be the same kind of concept. But so now you've got... Um, Another player getting out to X. I'm not sure what this guy was doing. I want to see what he was doing now. So there's your slide. Interesting. So as number four comes off the pick and rounds, and these players are all in their kind of off-ball game inside, the short stick in this big little stays and maintains his matchup. Now, as that happens, I don't know if he's late because he doesn't he, he he's worried about the throwback. I mean, I'm sure he's worried about the throwback too. But now as he comes across, he's way late. And when you look at Maryland's offense, you now have forward outlet, backward outlet, and then two inside again. And I would assume that Wisnowskis would be this position a lot because he's a lefty sniper and he, he has the ability to, you know, from this wing, that's kind of his, like, bread and butter, his spot. Now, 19, actually, I'm going to run this back really quick, and I just want to see who the actual, what numbers all of the attackmen are. So you've got one, obviously. I think this is 19 is here. Yep, and then 25, it looks like, or 15. Something with a 5 on the end of it. But So that's good to know, because now we kind of know exactly whether... So this is, this, is a, this is a LSM and a MIDI in a razor pick scenario, which is like, when's that ever going to happen in terms of like a structured set where you've got MIDI's high and attackmen low? Like, it's never going to happen. But so, then... If this is a call of some kind, once they run this play where they're razor picking and they've got the four players inside, now they're just playing. And that's the part where, you know, it can definitely be tough. And you kind of see them looking for these off-ball two-man plays behind as well, where once they separate this four-man play inside, once these four here, you know, You've got the cut off the side. You kind of had an up pick here. Now everyone's kind of separate, but then these two, this player and this player, still try to find their picks inside. Now, as it goes, he sets a pick, and then he comes this way, and this guy goes high, but they're all just creating chaos. So who are you going to slide from? That's my question. Is like Clearly they slid Coma with um, zero, but it definitely creates some some difficult situations offensively and defensively. Okay, I got to run and grab something. Sorry to do this, but I'm gonna, just going to let this roll so you guys can watch this for a second, and I will be right back.
And we're back. Okay. Sorry about that. So. Let's head back to this. See what you guys just saw. Looks like a high wing two man. Once again, big little. So another thing. Well, I like to know how play how, how teams attack in transition because there's such a big emphasis on um, just the up and down now that when you come into the offensive end, are you going to continually attack or are you going to kind of wait till you have your six on six? Maryland is obviously a little bit, they're waiting for their six on six. So this is something that I like to, it's almost an over, well, it, it is an overlap, but, so let's say you begin to just do this kind of free play concept, right? So here, you've got a forward outlet, backward outlet, and your through pass. You've got two players who are playing inside again. Now, as the ball as you have your initial two man here, I like to think of this as almost like a side weave, right? I really like this, this idea. So right here, you have an up pick. As he comes off, this player, Wisnowskis, is going to mirror to the top left. Now as this 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 pick come as this player comes off the pick, now he's just in a full out dodge down this alley, which Dodging the alleys puts the defense in a very stressful situation because if they do end up having to slide, you're just going to create numbers on the backside, right? That's that's offense 101. Now, where I really like this is that as he comes off of this, you see the show. He gets back. That was a really good play by this defenseman. Now, as the ball goes forward, now we're into almost like a weave concept where once he throws down, he is now picking and this player is coming back up the same way. And so I don't know if that's structured and then now they're just able to play, but not a bad not a bad idea once this player decides to come around the opposite side of the goal to then cut here. But when you think about structuring your offense, that free play creativity is something that can kind of go by the wayside because you're literally just trying to like swing the ball to opposite ends. So you dodge, you draw a slide, you swing to attack the backside, and then if nothing happens with that specific play, you then find the next dodge. We'll watch the, the beginning transition here, which if they lose the ball, that would be a tough... Okay, so they didn't. All right, we're going to continue and go back to Maryland's offense again. Or we'll just watch a little bit because they score right here. Nice play. Okay, so high wing dodge, high wing pick. You're still in a big little. Maryland's sitting back. This is the player who would switch or will slide. Now he gets under pretty easily, right? You've got a backside exchange here, and now this is what kind of creates the mismatch. Now what's interesting is that he didn't go. I don't know why 8 didn't go. <clears throat> so... Defenseman does get through, but at this point, he looks beat to me. And it looks like he's just looking straight up to it. Now, I don't see any option where this player would slide, ever. Right? He'd be sliding past his own guy. Now, as he does slide, that's just too easy. But maybe that's a... I mean, maybe they don't want... Maybe they don't want him going for some reason, but I don't. I can't really see why in terms of having the pick up here. But maybe that's something they'll fix or something that's just a, a bang bang play in uh, in what they'll kind of try and fix. I guess I don't know. All right, face off goes. Let's see if we're pushing transition, whichever way it goes. Ooh, that sucks. So. <clears throat> One of the most difficult things to teach players is is how to goose correctly. So a goose is, or a hockey, you can call it whatever you want, hitting the ball with the stick instead of just picking it up. So in my ground ball video, there's a section where I do kicking the ball. Like So if you miss and you go over, you're going to kick it to keep it in front of you, right? That's clear. But so 
where it gets a little bit dicey is when you think about the idea of like flicking the ball to someone because you, you don't think you're going to pick it up. Now, the, the, the place that happens most is here <clears throat> as the ball goes out the sideline. Now, this player clearly hears that, you know, the ball is going to be somewhere. So 40. I wonder if I can zoom in on this. Let's see. I should be able to. There you go. So as 40 flicks the ball, he flicks it right to somebody else. So the place where you like to goose most often is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, if someone's wide open to the left or to the right, instead of taking a 50-50 ground ball, you essentially hit it out to them and they have a one-on-0 -on ground ball. But if you just do it and you just hit the ball into the middle of the field, you can create chaos as, uh, for the other end as well. And so that's kind of where it, it can be dicey as you do that. So Petro and and Chimati, I think they both ran a sideline ground ball drill where players on the wings had to communicate to the players going to get the ground ball as it was rolled towards the sideline which way to goose the ball or if they should just pick it up cleanly. And um, so I know that collegiate teams practice that. It's just kind of, you know, this specific scenario, he flicked it to the other team. All right, it's into the offensive end, no transition. Now the players will sub or we're getting a D shot. Nope. Okay, so now we're having players sub. They're all subbing through the midline, which is essentially a defenseman came out so that the midfielders could sub on to the field on the defensive end and then they'll sub through the midline. That's what you see here. And so now we're attacking again. So two men here again. Player behind or player in front. Play player behind will be the player in the two men. Okay, so that's a read. We can make that a read. Coming out of the box, I love this dodge. This is one of my favorite dodges, especially if you use some kind of offensive attacking formation in transition as a slow break set. So back when Creek had Asher Nolting and Max Tennant, and so so if you don't know who Max Tennant is, he played Division Three. I'm not sure exactly which school he went in, but he set records for goals wherever he was, and this kid could just catch the ball and finish. But so then you had Asher who can easily draw a slide whenever he wants and you have to kind of double team him, especially at the high school level. And they destroyed people in transition in this way. But so um, the, the, what they were told was just to play fast because like Maryland, they were both, they were all really good players. There was another player. I'm not sure who it was, but they were really, really good players. And what they would do is they would attack three V three with the defensemen. And as they would do that, all the midfielders would sub. So if you've got a midfielder who's going to sit at the top of the box, like a lot of midfielders do, they're not even going to be involved in the play as the three attackmen are playing. And so they would get the ball in the offensive end, they would attack the goal, and they would draw slides in a 3v3 set versus a 6-on-6 six six set, which would inevitably give up goals. So the reason I really like that is because once you attack in that 3-on-3 three three <clears throat> set and you sub out your midfielders, you can then throw the ball. You never have to stop, and then you throw the ball up to a midfielder coming out of the box. And so... Where I then get to the read I was just mentioning was that as this player comes off of this two-man game, like this player clearly knows, okay, first off, he's probably right-handed, so he's on the right side of the field. Now, as this player comes off this pick, here are your reads in terms of playing freely within the system. If the player coming off the pick is going to your side, you have to pop out to become the forward outlet. Backward outlet will always be the other player in the two-man game. <clears throat> so... If you've seen any of my box two-man videos, I always say when you set a pick, you set it inside out so that you're goal side, right? So as this player comes out to set the pick, his objective is to be goal side of the player he's picking. And what that does is if he, if he impacts the pick where hopefully he doesn't get blown up, because if you get blown up, you're essentially just causing a slide. They Both players have to like get up. And what you really want to do is kind of be coy where you were. So this player slips out. Now, if you've seen my videos, I am basically always telling our players to, to slip to the goal or to roll to the goal. 
But if you have players that have range, they don't have to do that. They can actually pop out to the wing where they can then catch the ball and, and shoot it. Now, clearly, all of these players are going to have some form of range. Like, they're going to be able to shoot from 10 to 12 yards pretty efficiently. The question is whether the D1 goalies are going to be able to do it. But So that's what they seem to be doing is the majority of their two-man games end up with a player behind not slipping to the goal. Now, if they read it some other way where they then do, I think that's all just kind of a part of what they do. But it creates this read, which is if you're backside and you see the two-man game happening, someone has to be in front. That then isolates two other players where one player who's outside is now the through look and then the other two players are inside in their picking formation ready to play through their off-ball picks. So that's what you see here. So now you've got forward outlet, backward outlet, through look. Now we'll just play it out. <clears throat> Generated the switch. I think... Let's go back. No switch, just going to isolate the shorty. So now they're playing. They're going to find their next two-man. So this would just be a nice mirror two-man. They do draw the slide, but he throws forward. As he throws forward, now we're going to attack the backside. And let's just isolate and show the advantage. So slide goes. Really good job for 32 for kind of rotating over pretty quickly. Because <clears throat> if this ball is thrown back, he's going to have to get there because this is within range of this player. And now here's where you see forward outlet, backward outlet. I would put both of these players as through, which is totally fine as long as they have one. I think that accommodates their rules. And now if this player did throw back... That's where this rotation makes sense, and then this player would have to come up. But now, they throw forward, he attacks the backside, and so now we have <clears throat> we have two that were on ball before, and then one, two, three, versus one, two, let me get rid of that. Hold on. Let me actually say the word. So we've got double here. One, two, three, four, versus one, two, three. And so now you're attacking in space where no matter which player catches the ball now, you're then in a recovery one-on-one -on -one or you can just swing the ball, right? And so those recovery one-on-ones are so important because as, so that's where <clears throat> I would use either the general drill or a wind-up 1v1 drill there where now, as these players are firing out and having to rotate, the odds that their approach is going to be the best approach they can do is pretty minimal because they have to accommodate for those, you know, those players. Now, <clears throat> one second, let me get a drink. It's the only downside to coffee is kind of the flemminess. So... One thing I want to focus on here is Wisnowskis, right? You got probably the best player in the country, one of them, and he is now sealing his defenseman, which then now further isolates the one, two, three versus two. He decides to dodge. Virginia rematches up. Now, I want to focus on the recovery. So, okay, theory time. <clears throat> Why do you run odd man drills? You run odd man drills because there's going to be a lot of odd man situations if you carry into the offensive end and you have odd players. You teach the defenseman how to rotate. You also teach the offensive players how to step into space. Now, um, some of the best odd man scenarios that, that and, and drills that I've seen are more new age where you have a lot of different things that can happen. But the reason you do that is because you're teaching this back end of your rotation and the key is is once you go to even you got to tell the players you're going to have the same looks that you would with when you're odd when you have odd man when you draw a slide and then move it but now you're going to have to attack the defense faster because they're going to have the ability to recover but so now let's see how long it takes them 
So still not recovered, still not recovered. I guess now he, I'd say you'd probably have him recovered because he's in a decent position to get out to the player who's top center. But now he's still kind of trying to get out there. Now they send another slide. Skip through. Nice, nice shot. That was awesome. Okay. <clears throat> so here we, here we go again. So we're going to run that back one more time. We're going to start with this two men on the wing. So everybody's matched up. Two-man game goes. Mears went. We draw a slide. Now, as they swing the ball, Virginia's trying to recover, but then they get attacked again, right? So the throw to a first initial dodge. Now, if, if no one's going to slide here, he's, you know, free to score on the wing. They do draw a slide. He does a good job of getting away and then making his reads. And now you have your... So there's another player who's off screen here. I really don't know if you guys can see that. But so you should be able to see the one, I think. But so then you've got your through. You've got your forward outlet. Your backward outlet, which we were about to have another backward outlet. And then you have your two players who are inside. Now... Covering for these skip lanes after having to slide, recover, and then get attacked during your recovery, that's ridiculous. <clears throat> but so, what's probably not going to be the best thing about trying to analyze Maryland's offense, <clears throat> especially using the second quarter of this game, was the fact that since they score six times, I bet they have maybe eight possessions. So we'll see if their next possession is something where we could find something to analyze in terms of where Coach Tillman might say that their decision-making was wrong. Because like I mentioned before, once you decide to allow your players to play, you give them a very soft structure of what seems to be they're going to run a two-man game where they then have to have a forward outlet, backward outlet, through pass with two players that are kind of free to go inside and then analyze where they're going to attack the next two-man. And then you're worried more about decision-making of players getting to spots that they're really good at and then acknowledging when they draw slides or not and attacking efficiently. But if they score every time, they just do a really good job, whereas maybe we'll talk about some things that I see high school players do that they or reads they're making that might help and, and that some players don't really know. But I mean they're really good. Here's here's probably one of my best storylines that I think should be uh highlighted more. I think it should be highlighted a lot more actually if you're watching any Maryland game. Number two, Bubba Fairman. If you've got players who need to be confident in becoming defensive midfielders, tell them the story of Bubba Fairman. So, this kid's like the number one recruit in the country coming out of Utah, right? Brighton High School. When we played them, um, we tried to quadruple team this kid in a clear with all of our attackmen and an LSM. I think a midi went to the ball too, and he ran past all of us, right? So, elite athlete, one of the best players that I've ever watched play. He's playing on the first or second midfield at Maryland for the past, I don't know, three years, however long he's been there. I don't know if this is going to be his fifth year because of COVID or whatever. But this kid, in his senior season, gets moved to defensive midfield and kills it. Right, So I know so many players in high school that just like they don't want to play D-mid. They think that they're better and yada, yada. They're, they're all emotionally tied to the idea that they're going to be on that first midfield line. And Bubba's ability to do that in stride is just, it's so cool. It's so cool. Okay, so now back to the Maryland's offensive end. Let's see what they did in transition. Nice little fake dodge. Swing the ball. Swing the ball. <clears throat> now they're subbing. This is that part where um, that Creek team did really good to attack in transition. So we'll find a two-man here. All right. So that I want to talk about that acknowledgement in a second. Who was Virginia offsides? Or are they just late? They were just late. All right, so let's go back. 
Perfect. So one thing that you would have to say about a freelance offense like this is that everyone, you'd like everyone to be on the same page, right? But so if someone doesn't kind of understand where we're going from, then you create decisions that become tough because players think something's going to happen and they have to revert. So that's what it looked like happened here with, I think this is DeMeo. But so as he catches the ball, it looks like they're going to read and have a mark. So it, sound, it looks like this player is directing, saying, hey, this is who we want to dodge on. And as he swings it over, he's looking almost to come in to play a two-man. And then this player throws it right back, and now he's like, okay, it's actually me. So now they attack this two-man. Looked like a short short. Oh, okay, so they're trying to get him off the field. All right, so let's talk through that for a second. So let's say you're playing and you're on defense and you clear the ball and one of their offensive midfielders stays on the field. It sounds like this. This, is, this I think, is a defensive midfielder for Maryland and an offensive midfielder for, um, for Virginia. If you run this pick and you, and you teach your, what would it be? You teach your defensive midfielders to pick well where they're going to get a brush. You're going to end up creating an offensive player versus an offensive player. So if this player switches, now we end up with one of our offensive players versus one of their offensive players who is playing defense. Now, this also creates an issue where if these players are trying to marry or get off the field together and sub, which you're going to see here, right? So right now, He's free to go to the cage. Like, this is something where if he wants to turn inside and play, he totally could. I'm not sure where he came from. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. But so as this pick happens, right, now you see he's going to head off the field. This player's going to go with him. And there you go. Once again, if you're watching and you would like to see something specific or want me to address something specific, talk about offense or defense in any way, let me know. So they sub out. Now now we're going to get into actually playing. Wisnowski is going to go to his natural left side. We've got a swing swung over to this big alley dodge. You kind of see your your what I would call a umbrella set to a almost to a 141 once we get inside. Ooh, that was that was pretty nice. Okay, so this was a good decision making thing in terms of freelancing. So first, we're going to talk about the dodge, and we're going to talk about once the dodge is swung, how the players are going to realize and recognize exactly where and who's going to go to the ball next. So the dodge goes. This player is hot. Doesn't look like there's a two inside. Now this player does a great job of of curling behind the the slide so as this player goes one of these three players is going to try to attack him now if he can just extend and follow the slide he creates more distance from the twos which are going to allow him to have space behind right so now as this player shows and then tries to get back this player is reading him now we'll go back a few frames one of the things that teaching Dodgers is important is to understand and to know where to look in terms of which player is most likely going to be sliding to me. Because then, as you're, you're being contacted, especially against short sticks where you, your whole objective is kind of almost to body to get in so they can't use their sticks, so you can have your, your head up over the defenseman's shoulder with your, I want to say it's chin to shoulder, right? So if I'm dodging left-handed here, I want my chin on my shoulder so I can look up over the defenseman's head who, or, or through their box area so that I can then see who's coming to me. Now, as this happens, he kind of sees and steps away, but then once he goes back, now he's like, okay, I can reattack and go. Now, this is really good short stick defense by the Virginia defenseman. Now, with that, this player who mirrored, who, who followed the slide, now becomes the backward outlet. And so as he becomes this outlet and the ball is thrown up and then the player does slide, now he, he's got to step in and draw. 
once again, Wisnowskis sealing off part of the defense. Right? So now he comes over, and then he's going to sit here, and he's going to seal or pick, off-ball pick, this player from the rotation. That's a brilliant play. That's something that's really, really hard to teach. And so now as he tries to step around, then you've got your skip through. And so what you're going to see on this other end is, is Maryland is going to have to figure out who's going to be a part of the two-man game and who's not going to be a part of the two-man game. But so as the ball swings up and over, now both of these players end up going to the ball. They end up going to this two-man. And then one of them, this player, then backs up and backs out. But they maintain their rules, it looks like. Oh. And he ends up scoring. Wow, that was awesome. Okay. So I'm gonna, first I want to focus on the Wisnowska seal. Then I want to focus on how their continual ability to play freely is going to allow them to find little gaps. And once again, this is all about decision making, right? You hear everybody always say, you know, I teach how to play, not plays. And that's totally fine. But each time you're attacking the goal, there are different... Um, structures and different ideas where we're with that have to do with where we're attacking the field that you can add in but it doesn't have to be you know x's and o's like you would think in football so let's go back to the beginning and let's find Wisnowskis so Wisnowskis is here now the ability to set any of these screens is contingent on your understanding of defense now if you are in a traditional near man or um, what would it be? It'd be a near man or a crease slide capacity. You are going to want to throw back in order to cause a rotation. Now, he clearly knows this. So as he comes to the middle of the field <clears throat> and he sees this player mirror outside, he knows that if he gets the ball... The first person's going to have to rotate. So it's going to go one, two, three. And then one of these players is going to have to probably get back all the way through to this player. Or it could be him. You know, the key to rotations is not <clears throat> having everybody rotate, it's communicating how many people need to be involved in the rotation and making sure that guys match up as the ball comes to them. So as the ball comes back, now he sets his seal and doesn't allow this player to come back. I'm going to watch for that a lot more now because that's a very high-level IQ play where you're then sealing off ball, which is way cool. Um, <clears throat> then the ball comes over, swings. Now we're back into our two-man game here. This player lets Wisnowskis come set the pick. This is his lefty side. This is where a lot of times you're going to see him come down. Wisnowskis will float up. You'll throw back, and then Wisnowskis will have his, um, his, his lefty snipe. But so he backs out, you've got forward outlet, backward outlet, now he pops to be the now he pops to be the forward outlet and this guy becomes a through pass, passes over to him, and now you have kind of a recovery one on one where he hitches to the front and then scores. Alright, now let's watch the whole thing back in real time and recognize that everything I just talked about is all within decision making very quickly so you have your alley dodge with your mirror throw back with the seal with Wisnowskis doesn't feel it just moves the ball moves it again now we're picking again pops off the crease into space okay so the acknowledgement of the slide is what really sells that so right here as you're getting into that kind of second it's not the second two-man game. It's just the, the this far side wing two-man game. When I think of picks, what I think about is if we're going to play, we're basically going to act like these two defenders are one defender because if one of them gets beat, we're going to have to slide anyway. And so that creates a four-on-four -four backside that we're going to have to slide from. Now, another thing that's difficult to teach that box does really well is it teaches players how to kind of feel their defenseman because it's a lot tighter, right? And so as you're setting off ball picks and you're doing doing this and that, as you kind of grow up in that system, you just see it a lot more in box, especially really high-level box. Now, 
this player's acknowledgement that th- that he's looking like he's going to want to slide is what allows him to step into space and acknowledge that, hey, he's open here. And so then the ball's thrown into him, and he hitches, and he scores. And so that's a really difficult play on defense too, right? So <clears throat> this player's thinking, okay, I, got, I might have to slide, I might have to slide. This player's like, okay, where's my guy going? I got to make sure I follow him around so the ball doesn't come through and then have an alley dodge. And then this player's just following his guy. This player is just kind of hung up in his position here. And so he, they really do isolate the slide well here and then throw to his player, which then you've got a terrible approach. So in terms of the approaches, your first step as the ball swings is always the most important. So as the ball is thrown and he takes his angle this way instead of up, that's kind of what seals him and creates the bad angle for his um, step in and he gets hitched. But so really cool concepts, really cool idea of, I guess, how to, how to kind of structure and flow. And the um, another decision that I want to acknowledge here is this, when, when Wisnowskis does have this seal and the ball is thrown up, right? If he, so it looks like he's probably left-handed because he caught it left-handed unless unless the just catching on the outside is what this player has to do. But if he just steps in and shoots here, that's not a bad look. But the fact that he catches it, doesn't acknowledge in time, and then just winds up but then sees the defenseman coming and swings the ball and just keeps the offense running is so huge. Just because it allows them to just probe and continue to play instead of having someone think that they have to draw a slide and they have to do this and that, which you can kind of get into when you get into... um, When players start to think they have to do too much is when offenses die. So, nice play. All right, I think we're going to do one more offensive series and then we'll wrap it for the day. So I want to say Maryland is now four for four offensive series to goals in the second. I might be wrong, but that's that's great efficiency. Dude, what a play. What a defensive play. So I don't know if you saw it, but Penn versus Princeton, I don't know if it's overtime or double overtime, a defenseman's stick breaks. And that's what caused the final goal. I mean, clearly the kid had to catch it and shoot it, but basically, dude threw like a slap check. His stick broke. He had to drop it. He's immediately telling the defense to recover. Balls passed once to the player who like was in that little two-man scenario. And then, dude shot it and scored. But so here, this defenseman making this pickoff is huge. So he cross-checks him, stick breaks. He's got to leave the field. This play here to acknowledge that he's gone and now instead of having to play the ball or play his man, he's got to split two and then getting his stick up in the passing lane, like that's an epic play. That's an epic, epic defensive play. And then McNaney getting out behind to get the ball too, like that's, yeah, that's awesome. All right, and then Maryland will clear. Against the 10 man, which I think it must have been tipped, but we're doing an offensive one, so we're going to go continue to go over the offense. Got to show the stick breaking. <clears throat> All right. Looks like they're into their offensive set. <clears throat> Running that razor pick again. All right, so that's five or four for five now. So I think that was definitely taken in haste, it looks like. But so let's kind of watch how it happens. So a good razor pick here. I don't know if this... Is that a one or a four? Let me get rid of my marker. Okay, so it's a four. Perfect. So I was wondering why Wisnowskis was slipping out to his, his, his right hand, but so he's actually inside. 
not a terrible play, I guess, if he was hung up. But so as you, let's let's find our rules again. So come off the pick. I want to say he'll step out to be, Wisnowskis will step out to be the forward outlet. Actually, it's this player coming behind and leaving him inside. Now, once he gets to this spot and he gets turned back, I recognize the idea of the inside roll, but he does get squeezed. Um, where do they send? They send a coma slide again. So not a bad coma slide. They're, so, And that's the thing about Maryland is they have so many good shooters that they're, as players are trying to step down, you know, you're not going to want to slide off of this to leave him up here. Um, and that's where the coma slide was really good. That was actually two really good versions of coma slides within these examples. But so the, the trouble with this, this dodge, I think it's, this was just taken kind of in haste, right? He does get a step, but then this defenseman does a great job of, of basically doing Navy drill, which is, well, or Dolphin drill, where he's kind of jumping over the goal and then closing the gate because he knows his slide is going to come coma and coma means come across the crease right so as he gets upfield and now he's turning him back and then the uh the slide's going to come from here that's that's pretty huge that was a good defensive play i just think that that was probably a decision taken in haste from the maryland player but so when you watch them in the first few series as we've gone over you'll notice it's a lot more freelance there's nothing that's really forced they're all just basically playing through these ideas and then taking whatever comes to them so now i want to do one more because i want to talk through a little bit more of the like kind of what exactly you're training but it looks like we're just going to do a transition goal now so cause a turnover pole comes in the offensive end this is a great trailer play what a play okay so attackman you've got to teach him how to read the field as the ball is coming into the offensive end are we going to be in a fast break a green break which is simply a one-on-one -on -one, or a trailer break where a player is trailing behind or are we just kind of in our slow break concepts which for maryland is if it's slow break they're going to pass on to the attackman they might move their feet a little bit they might swing it through x but for the most part they're just going to get their personnel on if it's a slow break because they feel like the slow break is less efficient as their offense so once they cause this turnover here great save and they pick the ball up. These players, whoever's upfield, they're all going into the offensive end quickly. And so this read is huge because so many players, they just want to be the midi back when they see a pole carrying the ball. When if they just kind of like count what's ahead of them, it, it, it creates a more efficient read. But so now this player becomes the eventual goal scorer. Now, I think this player came out of the box too. So he's really a head man pass. No, he did not. This player came out of the box. Okay, so he's actually the attackman that's there. But so this would be an early call or a rabbit call. Um, and so as he calls early and gets the ball, the ball is swung down here, this pass. Now he's going to read the field, and the player who, who is first in is always going to cut the middle to the crease, which creates space for the throwback to the pole behind him. And now he's stepping in. To shoot it. Excellent play. All right, we'll see if we can get one more settled, one more settled play. There's a Virginia goal. I don't know if they hit 12 here, but so we'll watch this one. <clears throat> All right, into the offensive end. <clears throat> Subbing our poles out. We'll see where we go from here. Thanks for everyone tuning in. If you guys have any questions, let me know. If you want me to focus on something that I have not focused on, let me know. And then uh, leave comments if you're watching in posts about what you'd like to see and if you like this part of the video. So here's our two-man. Here's our four-on-four -four behind. Nice alley dodge to a throwback, and that's what we talked about before with Wisnowski sitting in that spot. So if you're going to run a freelance style offense, you're going to want your players to be in positions where they're going to be most successful, right? So for a player like Wisnowski, he's going to be on this lefty edge, and then as they run this two-man, and you see the... So now what we would say is... 
it's nice backside exchanges too. So you'd end up with your forward outlet. Actually, this would be the forward outlet, but they're going to exchange it. And then you have your backward outlet. But so now as the, as the pick happens, or not the pick, but just kind of, yeah, the mirror, the slipped pick, and he draws, now you then get Wisnowskis in space up top for the throwback, and then no one recovers quick enough. Not bad. Once again, this is all based on having elite players that can make great decisions, and that's kind of what it is. So we got a question, can you focus on the short stick defensive midfielder? So sure, um, in this set it's not a very good thing that happens, but so in terms of like how they're playing, right, he's obviously trying to push them down the side. He's then going to end up getting, he's, he kind of just gets beat here, and then he kind of sees the pick coming, where for this one, you know, it's really difficult because as you're this player here who's in their big little, he got caught earlier not wanting to switch off of um not wanting to switch off of Wisnowskis. But so the big thing about short stick defensive midfielders is that they're gonna have to know that they're gonna get dodged on every single time. Right? It's just you'd rather dodge on them than, than dodge on a pole unless you don't have the personnel to dodge against a short six because you don't have enough offensive threats. But so um let's do that in the next one. I got to get rolling at this point, but so um, if you hop on next time, remind me for sure in terms of getting to some more short stick defensive midfielders. And then what kind of things do you mean in terms of doing the defensive midfielder? Do you want to know like what their techniques are, how offenses are manipulating them, what they need to be aware of, um, or just kind of like the overall ideas behind what they do? Um, kind of let me know which, which one of those you are thinking. But So that's going to wrap it up for today. Happy Friday, everybody. I hope you guys have a great day. Let me know what you guys thought down in the comments section. Have a good one, and I will see you guys.